Dear learners, on behalf of the Faculty of English, School of Humanities of Netaji Subhash Open University, I welcome you to this postgraduate English curriculum in English. Within the precincts of the ODL or the Open and Distance Learning, this course that you are undertaking in English will give you an advanced degree of Masters in English. In this video lecture, you will be acquainted with the course content, the objectives of the course, and of course, the best way to go about with it. Before that, I'd like to tell you that by choosing the open and distance mode of learning, you have actually chosen not an easier option, but in fact, a more challenging one. That is because here you are called a learner and not a student. This means ideally that the entire focus of learning is on your self-motivated study. On behalf of the university, we will be providing you the basic amenities like your study material, the personal contact programs. We have an online support system to cater directly to you. And then this AV lectures which will in a nutshell, try and provide you overview of certain key aspects of your syllabus. The challenge you will understand is more for those of you who have not graduated with an honors in English, because by virtue of being a flexible mode of learning, you have been allowed entry into the postgraduate level. But that obviously means that you have to bring yourself up to the required and desired levels as early as possible. In this introductory lecture, what I'll do is try and acquaint you with the periods of English literature, the history of English literature, so to say, the different genres, and then try and correlate what has, what in the cultural scenario has led to the development of literary texts. To talk of periods in history, makes it necessary to talk of geography as well. Let us first place England on the map of Europe. You see two maps following one another. The first one is of Britain as a Roman colony, which it was till 450 AD. And the other, the current map of Europe, where you can place England. In both maps, Notice how the location of England becomes a key factor in exposing the country to different political cultural influences over the ages. As a student of English literature, you need to know the history of Britain from its days as a Roman colony to the evolution of the present nation. It is a long and checkered history that will give you an idea of how culture in general and literature in particular has evolved in England. I would also advise you to go through the social and cultural history of Britain to develop a comprehensive understanding of its literature. Here you have a few quick references, very basic texts, very seminal texts and easily available ones too, that would give you a better picture. We shall now move to the periods into which we conventionally classify history of literature and also the rationale behind it. There are different ways we do this, but in classifying the political social and cultural history of Britain. Here I shall be going by the methodology that we mostly follow in academia. We have divided the cross section into nomenclatures, time spans, the rationale behind it and the representative texts that you have in your syllabus. As you see, the first period that we are talking of is the Old English or the Anglo-Saxon period. This Anglo-Saxon period 
is the time frame that we are looking at is 450 to 1066 AD and the rationale behind this is to begin with the invasion of Britain by the Germanic tribes and follow it up to the conquest of England in 1066 by the Norman French. In terms of literary texts of this period, we are talking of the entire corpus of Old English literature, which was basically oral, later put into script, the representative text of the period being the Old English epic Beowulf. The second phase that we talk of would be 1066 to 1500 AD, where the important dates would be 1400 being the year of Chaucer's death and 1453, which was the fall of the Byzantine Empire to the Ottoman Turks and thereby the beginnings of the historical beginnings of what we know as the Renaissance. The next period that we have is a pretty longish one where we are talking from the Renaissance, the resultant reformation as a religio-cultural movement till the, the restoration. In terms of time frame, we are looking at the period from the mid 16th century to 1660. And this again is divided into several political periods in terms of reign. We have the Tudor period, the Elizabethan period, the Jacobian period, the Caroline age and the Commonwealth period. You will notice in your syllabus that there are a large number of texts of different genres from this period. We have Shakespeare's Hamlet in 1601, Tempest which dates to 1610-11, we have Marlowe, we have the first English sonnets by Wyatt and Surrey followed by the poetry of Spencer. And then again, we are talking of Johnson, the metaphysical poets and the early Milton. The next period chronologically would be the Enlightenment, which is also called the Neoclassical period, dating from 1660 to 1790. This again is classified in terms of the restoration, which was from 1660 to 1700 the Augustan age from 1700 to 1750 and the age of Dr. Johnson, Dr. Samuel Johnson that is from 1750 to 1790. Now notice interestingly that we have placed Milton in the earlier period also. But if you look at Paradise Lost, the text that you are studying, that dates to 1667 along with Dryden's Absalom and Achitophel. Pope's epistle and the beginnings of romanticism, the early romantic poets like Blake. Now, interestingly, as we approach the end of the neoclassical period, we also notice the beginnings of romantic tendencies in the form of the precursors of romantic poetry. The significant poet among them that is there in your syllabus being William Blake, whose Songs of Innocence date to 1789 and Songs of Experience to 1794. Then follows the Romantic period, the ground for which had already been laid by the precursors and chronologically historically dating to 1798, the year that was significant because of the joint publication of the lyrical ballads by Wordsworth and Coleridge. This is the movement that registers for the first time perhaps several movements across the globe. For example, we are not just talking of Europe in terms of the French Revolution. There is also the American War of Independence, the role of Tom Paine, the role of philosophers in the French Revolution, all of which cumulatively went on to provide a democratic spirit to romantic poetry, something that was strikingly absent in poems of the neoclassical period. Once again, when we move on from the Romantic to the Victorian period, 
we are talking of the industrial revolution we are talking of an empire where the sun never sets we are talking of theories of darwin marx freud all of which went on to change not just the face of poetry or literature but also the entire approach to life itself moving to the modern period which chronologically is taken as the first half of the 20th century the major poets that you have in this section from your syllabus are w b yeats and t s eliot while there is a dramatist shaw the novelist conrad and joyce now this shift from modernism to postmodernism is a very tricky thing because it's difficult to fix up a kind of an end date for modernism and a start date for postmodernism the the border lines are actually blurred but then with the cessation of colonies with the coming up of new trends in literature like magic realism the rise of the absurd what was happening cumulatively in the field of literature was that there was a dissolution of boundaries between so called form and content and it is this dissolution which further goes on to produce other kinds of disillusionment that perhaps postmodernism registers as its own discourse now what exactly do we see when we try and analyze these timelines that i have just tried to present before you there are certain very interesting things that you would see first since the attempt has been to locate and situate authors and syllabized texts you will notice that in terms of history we are covering a span that goes nearly 1500 years and if we are talking in terms of textual history chaucer's canterbury tales a prologue to which happens to be your first poetry text would date towards the end of 1380s so that way we are looking at more than 600 years of literary history of britain next notice how nomenclatures keep veering upon one another for instance when you are talking of romantic period being followed by the victorian period you will see there is a continuity of trends similarly as i was just talking of modernism modernism and postmodernism it's not really possible to segregate and make watertight compartments so what we do basically is to kind of follow a chronology for purposes of categorizing but then the overlappings are always there and another interesting trend that you would have noticed is the close interconnection that exists between cultural history and literary history definitely within the scope of this short lecture it's not possible to map out the entire terrain but once you go to your literary texts and try and associate them with the context that produced them you will find that the links are very close either mirroring or critiquing anyway literature and society as you call it continues to have a very close symbiotic relationship now let's try and understand the syllabus that you have your papers are mostly divided genre wise refer to the timelines and you will be able to place the literary texts in papers 1 3 and 4 which are poetry drama and novel respectively paper 2 is devoted exclusively to studying language paper 5 will deal with literary theory and criticism your paper 6 is american literature as a broad strata of english literature paper 7 takes up indian literature in english and here we include both indian writings in english and translations from bhasha literatures into english and paper 8 will cover a vast area between ancient and modern european classics now what are the aims of the syllabus that we have brought out before you primarily we intend to inculcate a detailed knowledge of english literature we want a comprehension of the range of what goes under the broad category of literature in english irrespective of the country of origin as also 
the ways of approaching literature through language. Next, we intend to place literary texts in contiguity with movements and trends, both sociological and literary. And finally, there is the attempt to bridge and understand the linkages between literature and the social sciences. Dear learner, you need to understand that no syllabus in the humanities, literature more specifically, can ever be self-contained because it goes on evolving with the time, with the society. So, this syllabus that we have designed for you is basically aimed to provide an overview of trends, perspectives and of course history. And the onus definitely is on you to enhance, to add to it. Your teachers will be providing you additional references, maybe additional texts even. And yes, your primary responsibility does include reading your literary texts first hand. Please keep in mind, summaries do not substitute for literary texts. So, with these few words, we shall conclude this lecture. Once again, wishing you all the best in your academic efforts. Thank you.